So hey guys, welcome to another Tuesday webinar. Hopefully you're all doing well. I'm just going to share my slides with you today as well. Good stuff. And if you're watching this in the recording as well, hopefully you find this session valuable. So I'm um, just going to do a quick little audio check. Can you just let me know in the chat box if you can hear me okay? We've got Richard, we've got Polly. I couldn't find that in your music. We've got Siri, we've got per Paridi, is it? We've got Lorraine, we've got Katie, we've got Caroline, we've got Brian. Cool, good stuff. Excellent. So what we wanted to focus on today is we had um, we had a couple of people kind of, you know, ask us questions about it as well. And, and it's something that I've been asked a lot as well personally. And I always kind of struggle to know what to say. So, and that's therapy, right? And, and how do you find a therapist that works for you? So we really wanted to kind of dive into that topic a little bit today. We kind of reached out to our head of psychology, Lauren Callahan, and kind of said to her, hey, have you got any advice on how do you find the right therapist um, when it comes to obviously, you know, trying to get that help? And she sent over sort of 10, 12 different ideas, and we've kind of compressed them down for this webinar just into seven top tips that are going to help you find the therapist that you might benefit from. And this is obviously advice that you might want to share with others as well. So in terms of what we're gonna be getting from today's session, it's the importance of therapy and I'll also share my personal experience. And also as well, you know, feel free to maybe share yours if, if you feel okay to do so. How do you find the right therapist? So like I said, we're gonna share seven tips to help you find the right therapist. And then time for sort of Q and A or maybe you sharing your own personal experience as well if you want to at the end as well. So as we always do, guys, I'm um, asking this question, how are you? So how has your week been? Is there anything that you kind of want to share? If you've had a good week, just say you've had a good week. If there's anything that you've kind of, you know, found challenging, again, you know, feel free to, to share that as well. I would say last week's been good, good for me. And, and what has been good is, is my wife. My wife is super organized and she's noticed that I've been working a lot. And, and she knows that when I'm working a lot, I'm kind of hiding myself from something, right? And... Um, she said, like, hey, do you want me to help you organize your workload a little bit more? Because I was obviously getting stressed with the workload that I had on. And, and we kind of sat down together and, you know, she's kind of planned out, like, you do this from 9 to 9.30, you do this from 9.30 to 10, something that you have to do every day, and then you do this. Um, and she's kind of helping me manage my diary a little bit more. But also, she's making me accountable to start at 9, finish at 5.30. So I've been doing that. I did that yesterday. I'm going to do that again today. And, you know, I definitely feel a little bit better about doing that. Uh, Katie says, I'm fantastic. Found out I passed my degree of a 2-1 and got in my master's degree for September. Well done, Katie. Amazing stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, looking forward to uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to signing that September as well. Caroline says, it's been good. Work announcements today regarding restructuring. Although work announcements today regarding restructuring. Well done, Katie. Congratulations. Yeah, there's still going to be a lot of uncertainty, big decisions to be made by a lot of companies, you know, during this time. And, and I'm sure some of us will be impacted by that. So it's so a really it's kind of, you know, just just being aware of that. But knowing as well, as we said last last webinar, that you know, you guys have managed this so far, you're gonna manage anything else that's been thrown at you as well. Uh Pierre says week's been okay so far, however, this month, two years ago. I lost my grandma and it's still painful at times, struggling with this right now. Anniversaries are always hard, Pierre. I find that they just sometimes like get you in the, and they just punch you in the face, right? Sometimes, and you don't really know how to, how to process them and deal with them. I would just say from my own experience of anniversaries and, and having those emotions is, is, you know, it's okay. You know, just, just accept them for what they are. Don't force against them because sometimes I think when you force against them, it, it makes it, it makes it worse. It's, it's, it's emotions that we often need to accept. Uh, Polly says, first day of working from home for me, I changed roles in the middle of lockdowns. So it's been very strange. Struggling with new dynamics and working totally alone being after being in a very busy team. Yeah, I'm sure that is a big change, Polly. You know, working from home is something that we've put a lot of content and a lot of advice out for. But, you know, if this is something that you're doing for the first time, I would just kind of say, you know, manage your own expectations of working from home. I feel like we feel like we have more time when we work from home. So we give ourselves more stuff to do. Um, manage those kind of expectations, as I kind of shared. Like, you know, I'm trying to finish at half five. Having that routine is important as well. Um, Janine says, way to go, Katie. So, guys, really appreciate that. And like I said, even though these sessions are hopefully going to give you some advice and some sort of, you know, 
stuff to take away i equally want them to be a place where you feel like you can talk about your week if it's been good if it's been bad and and kind of see other people supporting you i uh, got furloughed three months back and luckily joined a new organization recently it's challenging and strange working with people you haven't seen faces before yeah i can totally totally get that 100 percent. and i think it's that anxiety of maybe what will people think of me you know how am i going to be perceived how will i fit back in when we go back to the office, but you know, I think it's amazing that you've managed to get that that new job and that new challenge, and I'm sure you're going to be able to face that as well. George says I felt a bit full on due to Father's Day, and one of our close family friends passed away last week. Really sorry to hear that. Uh, leaving behind his wife and two adult sons, one in the UK, unable to attend the funeral. Yeah, sorry to hear that, George. It is tough. It really is tough. And I think it's, you know, just doing what you can to be there for them, I'm sure. And yeah, I totally get Father's Day. This, Father's Day is always a bit of a challenge. But I'm sure, you know, you're getting through that the same as you, you're getting through a lot of other stuff too. Guys, really appreciate your honesty as always. It's amazing to see that. Um, as I said, you know, I always kind of share my story, but, you know, you guys are a regular, as you know me, kind of Paul, you know, the founder of Every Minor Work, but equally I do a lot of work around campaigning for mental health to try and help people that might be suffering in silence. I do that via sharing my own personal experience of depression and anxiety, and at the same time, you know, losing my dad to suicide and, and how that's impacted me too. But really wanted to talk about therapy um, in today's session. So just quickly say yes or no. Have any of you ever been to therapy? Again, if you don't want to disclose, you don't have to disclose, but have you ever been to therapy? Polly says yes, Caroline yes, Janine yes, Richard yes, Maddie yes. Amazing. Pia yes. George and I. Really note work with therapists though. Okay. That's, that's surprising actually guys, you know, not that I wouldn't expect people to go to therapy, but it, it's good to see that. Polly's a therapist herself, good stuff. Uh, Polly, you might be able to chime in with some, some strategies and tips here as well. So feel free, if you want to, you know, just drop it in the comments and, and I can read that out if you feel like there's something that you want to add. But my personal experience with therapy was, was pretty simple, right? But, you know, straight after I lost my dad to suicide, I, you know, obviously struggled a little bit with the grief. I went to the doctors to get kind of signed off from work for about, I think I got signed off for about a month. And, you know, he was obviously the family doctor. He knew my dad, my mom, my brother, me. And kind of said to me, you know, you need to, you need to talk about it. And I was like, no, 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 it's fine. But I was also, you know, I was also open to it. So I said, yeah, okay. So give him his due, right? Because there's obviously a, a lot of people say about the huge waiting list of therapy. No worries, Lorraine. He, I remember this, you know, 18, no, no it must've been about 90, just turned 19, a couple of weeks after maybe my dad's suicide. And I was there and he said, look, you need to speak to someone. And I remember him saying, okay, here's the next appointment, but come with me. And he stood up and he walked to the reception and he, he sat, he stood there over them and was like, find this, find this guy an appointment as soon as possible. And I think they weren't very happy with it, but they managed to find me an appointment. I think it was pretty quickly, like a week or two weeks later. Um, and I remember that because it's, it's small things like that when someone goes out of their way and they've actually treated me like someone who needs that support and they've done what they can like I remember that there's there's stuff with my doctor that I never used to like about him but that one thing stands out to me and I remember that and I went to see this lady and you know this was again a couple of months after I was in the doctor's environment when I'd walked into the doctors I'd wait they'd call me into a room and then I saw this lady and she kind of obviously was talking about grief talking about obviously how I was experiencing you know what I was experiencing and I think on maybe the second session, she gave me a book and, and wrote down a couple of breathing exercises, but I never went after that. Now, the reason why I don't think I ever went after that was personally, I just think it was a bit too, too soon and a bit too raw. And, you know, breathing exercises at that time just didn't really seem to help me. I was like, mm, this is never going to work. All I want is my dad to come back, right? All I want is this to just, this nightmare to be over and, and doing some breathing exercises. I was, I was a bit sort of like, nah, this isn't going to work. And then about a year later, I was obviously, you know, wanting to deal with it again. And I went and booked a psychologist. Um, I think she was a psychologist. And I did one session and that was it. Now, again, it could have been the time. I don't think it was the person, but I just didn't feel comfortable, especially at that time, like trying to force talk into someone and then, you know, paying her 60 pound, I think it was. 
And I was like, you know, how many, this hasn't helped me this session. So to, to how many times have I got to go for it to be helpful? And then the lady who helped me, Anne, the, the story of Anne is always a funny one where um, my, my, my now wife, we were only kind of like, we'd only just started seeing each other back then. I was 21. Um, I had a back problem, right? And I tried acupuncture, I tried a chiropractor and everything. And, and I was obviously working at a desk, sitting down and I had a back problem. And she said, hey, you should go see this lady called Anne. You know, she does massage and she takes donations, right? So she's not a business. She literally just takes donations. You put money in a pot, um, so it's not expensive. And then she went, and she's weird. She knows stuff about you that you don't know about yourself, right? And I think she said she's a, she's a witch. And then um, the, the lady who lived above us, who was a friend of Amy's as well, um, came down and was like, yeah, I've known Anne for, for ages. I go and see Anne. And, she, and they were like, she's really weird. She's really, really weird. And I was like, oh. Okay, yeah, at 21, I was drawn to this. So I, I booked an appointment with Van, um, walked into a little bungalow and, you know, walked into the room on the right. The curtains are closed. There's kind of like oils and just like a small little bench and a couch and just books, like books everywhere. And this little lady walks in, right? Anne's going to be 5'4". You know, don't forget I'm 6'1". So, you know, five, four lady walks in, like long curly hair, sort of like beads and stuff. And I'm like, wow, you know, what, what have I got myself into? My friends could see me right now. What's going to happen? And Emma's like, you know, why are you here? I said, I've got a back problem. And she said, okay, have you seen a chiropractor? You know, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen a chiropractor. I've tried this. I've got a back problem. And she started to ask a couple of questions. She was like, okay, you know, choose your oils. So I chose three oils. She then started to read to me what these oils meant. And I was like, mm, what is this? But I was still quite, I was quite into it. And then I um, got the massage, went home and booked another appointment for next week. Came back next week, you know, hey, how's your back? Yeah, not bad. You know, here's a number of the chiropractor I go and see. She gave me a number of a chiropractor. And I think it was that session when she was like, why are you here? And I was like, I'm here for my back. And then she said, no, no, no. You know, why are you really here? And I was just like, whoa. And the second time of her asking it, and I think on the first session, she started to talk a little bit more about her life and she showed quite vulnerability as well. And I don't know what came over me, but I just burst into tears. I just cried and cried and cried. And I said, like, you know, my dad took his own life. I don't know what to do. And I just kept crying and crying and crying. And, and, and that was the first time that I'd really kind of said those words aloud. And what Anne was amazing at was just giving me that space, showing that compassion. Um, I think what else also helped with that experience was I went there for my back. Does that make sense? So it wasn't like a forced environment like the doctors. So I'm in the doctors. It's very clinical. This was just a lady who had been through quite a lot. And, and, you know, I was sort of drawn towards that. And, you know, and, and, you know, she's just, she's just phenomenal. I can't, I can't put her into words. You know, she isn't someone who had a qualification in therapy. She isn't someone who was a trained counselor, but what Anne was, was someone who understood. And she was the person that I felt safe to talk to. And then I saw Anne twice a week for a long time. She would give me books. She would let me know, oh, watch this YouTube video, do this, do this, do this. And, you know, I still see Anne today. Um, I, you know, I speak to her quite a lot on sort of Facebook and, and phone call. Anne's in her 70s now. And I'll see her whenever I see everything goes back to normal. Um, but yeah, she's amazing. And my mum also, you know, that with her own sort of issues, she went and saw Anne as well. And Anne was the only person that got my mum to fully deal with what she was going through as well. Um, equally, and this is a really important point, but we're going to touch on in a minute. So many people have heard about Anne and they're like, wow, Anne's amazing. We need an Anne in our county. We need an Anne here. I want to go and see Anne. And, you know, I've, I've been vocal about her and I wrote about Anne in my book as well. And, and I've had probably about five to 10 people that have read my book local to, to me book up an appointment with Anne. And I would say probably... I don't know, I'd say 50, 60, 70% of them. I've just said it hasn't worked for them. You know, this isn't, this isn't what I expect. This isn't something that has helped. So Anne isn't magic in any way. It's just personally, I really kind of felt comfortable and, and related to her and that whole holistic approach. Whereas other people want something a little bit different, right? And this is the key thing with, with therapy. Uh, Polly says, sometimes the greatest gift the person could give another is to hold the space and allow us to process. I love that. So, in terms of these tips, again, this was sort of tips that was provided by us by, by Lauren. Lauren's got a wealth of experiences as a, 
as a clinical psychologist. She owned her own practice in, in, in London for a long time. She now um, works over in, in, in Australia. And, you know, she's someone who, who's a key asset to our team from a psychology point of view. And she kind of shared some of these tips and I've kind of put my own little spin on them as well. So the first tip is to do some research. There's so many different types of therapies for different problems. So we have to kind of find what therapy type is recommended for our problem. If we're not sure, then of course we could maybe do an assessment session first with someone. Um, again, another tip that I'll show you in a minute is, is don't be afraid to just call people up and ask some questions. But really it's about doing that little bit of research up front, you know, determining what type of therapy is going to be best for us. You know, there's NLP, there's CBT, there's hypnotherapy, there's psychology, there's psychiatry, there's, you know, a wealth of other sort of, you know, types of therapy in between, you know, holistic therapy, whatever. Um, you have to just do a little bit of research, you know, think about what is it that you're going there for or aiming to kind of achieve, and then obviously see what kind of therapy type is recommended for you. There's a lot of great resources and articles out there as well. But like I said, you know, one of the tips is don't be afraid to ask, you know, therapists these questions that you want to kind of answer. Remember that number two is not all therapists treat the same problems. There's no like one size fits all approach to therapy, right? You know, and takes more of a holistic spiritual kind of approach, looks at it in, in a, I, almost a bigger picture. And, and I, I kind of like that. Um, she did explain to me once, and I don't know how much of this is true. She said, the reason why you was drawn to that whole holistic spirituality kind of, you know, feel is you was trying to figure out what happened to your dad. Now that could be the case. Um, but I'm also quite a deep, 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 deep thinker. So I think that's a big part of it too. But and in, in the same hand, you know, someone who might be sort of struggling with anxiety might be drawn more towards CBT, right? So, um, again, it's, it's kind of very individual, but, you know, it could be CBT that you go for if you've got an anxiety problem. Equally, if you've got a relationship problem, then you might want to see someone who is experienced in relationship counseling. So who is that person that has that experience in relationship counseling? I've had many people reach out to me as well that are bereaved by suicide. And they're like, hey, I want counseling. I want therapy. I don't want to just ring up someone who um, doesn't understand like that someone hasn't been through that. So there are obviously experts out there that, you know, focus purely on, on sort of suicide bereavement because, you know, you could go to accounts, a therapist that's obviously focused on grief, but suicide grief is, is, is grief with the volume turned up sometimes. So it's like, unless someone has maybe been there or understood it, it's very sometimes difficult for them to show that compassion as well sometimes. So I totally get that. You know, if someone is looking for that support of suicide grief, they might look for someone who has maybe experienced it or has more expertise around it that obviously they can, you know, sort of open up to as well. Um, you know, so check your therapist specialties, you know, see kind of, you know, what they specialize in and, and know that therapists don't obviously solve you know don't take a one size fits all approach and i think any therapist that does say like i can cure anything that you're going through i think is you know someone to shy away from as well i think you have to try and find someone who's who's relative to what you're looking that for that help for um george says i can relate as i also had major back problems shortly after losing my father yeah i twisted my spine 180 degrees while lifting heavy furniture i had to be hospitalized go for physiotherapy to learn how to walk properly over six months so to hear that, George, and again, you know, I, I think we carry a lot of physical weight when we're struggling mentally sometimes as well. You know, my back problems, you know, I still get a little bit of like, oh, my back aches, but a lot of it so slowly started to disappear, um, you know, with the right physio, but also at the same time when I was starting to deal with a lot of the sort of emotions I hadn't dealt with as well. So, you know, there's a lot of sort of research into that as well. Um, which I'm, I'm fascinated by. Uh, tip number three is ask for a recommendation. I think this is really key. You know, your friends, your family, someone that you're close to may have already been to a therapist that they really liked and helped. And I, I find this is the typical way that we'll try and find a therapist. So we'll reach out to someone, hey, you know, I know that you've been going to therapy and, you know, you seem to really like your therapist. Would you recommend them? And that person would obviously give you, say, hey, yeah, I really do think that you should go there. Or they might say, hey, no, it might not be something that you want to go to. Like, I always recommend Anne. But at the same time, I'm like, look, hey, remember what works for me might not work for you. But I highly recommend you give her a call, you know, go and give it a try. So I'm always kind of recommending Anne to anyone nearby. I've probably got two or three people that do like online sessions I tend to recommend as well at different price points. Um, just because they're people that I just admire. And I think that they're really good at what they do. Um, so I would happily recommend them. So I think it's, you know, looking for that recommendation as well. And, and I'm sure, 
you know, as we've already seen, you know, a majority of people in this, in this already have been to therapy. So I'm sure you know what to kind of look for and you can obviously help others with that too. Also some charities may be able to recommend a therapist, you know, some charities work with therapists and, and equally as well, if, if money is a problem, some charities may be able to provide that therapy for free or a discounted rate as well, working with their therapists that they obviously use. Um, again, charities do amazing work kind of picking up the slack that, you know, there's that kind of big hole at the moment. Or a GP might be able to recommend a good therapist as well. Um, so definitely, definitely look for that recommendation. Uh, Polly says, I completely agree with the sentiment of checking out what the therapist offers. Be mindful of those who have a big, great, long list of specialties. It is better research for a bit longer it's better to research for a bit longer than leap into it. Find someone who only has two or three specialties. Yeah, I really, really like that. Um, Richard says, I went the other way. I wanted someone that no one knew. So no one would find out what I was going. I can massively relate to that as well, Richard. Um, and that recommendation might come online as well, right? We might obviously find someone that we might be involved in a group or a local community or, or something along those lines. And they might obviously recommend it. At the same time, a lot of these sort of directories of therapists have reviews. So that's obviously something else that a lot of people are influenced by as well. Um, but yeah, I totally get that, Richard, as well. Um, Lorraine has shared a link as well, how to find a therapist. I'm going to look into that as well, Lorraine. I'm sure that would be very interesting. Tip number four is it's okay to shop around. I don't like the word shop around, right? But you know, you know what we're trying to say here. You know, going to therapy is a big step and, and having a relationship with your therapist will obviously help you make progress. But if you don't have a good rapport with them, it's okay to try another one. I feel like sometimes when we go to therapy and maybe we've sort of, you know, been a couple of times and it doesn't feel right, we almost feel like we need to stay with that person um, because we feel like if we, you know, try a different therapist, it might not be as effective. But it is okay to, to, to move and, and try a different therapist if that therapist isn't, you know, sort of benefiting you. Um, I think that's really important. And, and one thing that I always kind of say with therapy is, is lots of people say therapy doesn't work. Therapy hadn't, didn't help me, right? And I'm like, therapy as, as, a, as a broad spectrum isn't the problem. It's just obviously, you know, the therapist or the therapist that you went and saw isn't someone who's going to, you know, help you, someone that you couldn't build that rapport with, that you didn't sort of feel safe to speak to. So don't write off therapy as a whole, because as we've said, you know, there's so many different types of therapy. So I wouldn't hesitate, as we say, kind of saying, you know, you could try a therapist and if it doesn't work for you, then don't be afraid of saying, hey, you know, this isn't this isn't right for me. I'm going to maybe try a, a different one and, and see how that goes as well. Um, Polly says, and realistically, a good therapist should be able to pick up on the fact it's not working. Yeah, I agree. And is and is and it will never hesitate to say, like, hey, I don't think this is going to work, you know. If, if she's trying to help and that person isn't really willing and they're not willing to open up, she's, she's, she's fine to say, Hey, I don't think this is going to work, but here's someone else that might, my dad was a physiotherapist as well. You know, and I remember my dad as a physiotherapist used to have clients go upstairs at like 8 PM, for example, after work, and they'd come straight down at like 10 past eight. And I'd say, dad, you know, what happened there? Cause normally they're an hour session. He's like, I can't do anything for them. You know, they've either got to go to a chiropractor or they've got to go to the hospital or, or whatever. Um, and I think that's really key. If that therapist is just holding on for so long, you know, I think it's, it's their responsibility to let you know if it's something that they don't think is going to help you anymore as well. Um, and Lauren put this note as well, which I thought was really key. You know, don't change just because you don't like what they're saying. Sometimes they need to tell you things that are hard to hear. And I used to walk into Anne's with this huge dread of, I don't really want to talk about this stuff today. Um, you know, I don't really want to be here. And I'd go in and she'd start really calling me out on some of it, you know, and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to talk about this. And I'd maybe like beat around it a little bit and she'd continue to, to try and call me out on it. And she would also maybe say stuff that I didn't really want to hear. And at that moment, it didn't feel good. But of course, long term, that was so crucial in my, in my recovery and, and me sort of, you know, starting to process these emotions is, is she would say stuff that I sometimes didn't really want to hear. And I think that's key. If I would have walked out at that stage and said, Hey, like, Anne, I don't want to hear this, you know, that's it. You know, my, my trajectory, my, you know, the way I deal with my emotions now would have been completely different. So I think it's important to shop around. It's important to, to find other people as well. Um, equally, while I was still seeing Anne, I was speaking to different mentors. I was speaking to different people, and you know, I'm not, you know, there was different books I was reading. So I think it's a combination of, of everything as well. Um, where are we? George says it's often more comfortable to go 
to an independent therapist who is not counseling any friends or relatives to ensure doctor patient confidentiality and objectivity. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, Lorraine says feeling comfortable with your therapist is very important. Therapy is not easy. It takes time. It takes work, even homework. Sometimes it's not a quick fix. For me, it helped me look at things from a different perspective. You get out what you put in. Polly says change does not come without discomfort. We are both marble, the marble and the sculptor. Yeah. Great stuff, guys. I'm really enjoying this. And, and I think on that note as well, my experience of therapy is that that time when I first ever shared to Anne, it was like, wow, this feels slightly better, but equally I feel, I'm going to swear, I feel effing terrible as well at the same time, right? And the reason why that was, was because this wound that I've been like putting band-aids on for the last two years or plasters, whatever you want to call them, um, as, as all of a sudden now been exposed, like I've exposed this wound and now it's out for, you know, everyone to see or for Anne to see. Right. And I remember sort of talking to her and crying and crying and crying and crying and crying. And, crying. and then after the session, I just sat in my car and I just cried and cried and cried and cried. And I was like, if this is therapy, I don't want to do it because this isn't, this isn't helping me at all. Like I wasn't crying before this. I come into this session and I felt all right. And now I'm, I'm crying my eyes out. Like this isn't, this isn't helping, you know, because I was looking for that quick fix. Um, and this wound has just been exposed. But what I did that was the, the best thing that I've ever done is I didn't just go and grab another plaster from the cupboard and put it on, on the wound. I went back to Anne and, and I continued to try and, you know, look at that wound and try and heal it you know, and try and deal with it rather than just continue to put that plaster on it, which I was doing for a long time. That plaster was overwork and that plaster was drinking nearly every weekend, you know, out of my friends. That plaster was buying myself a new car and feeling good for about a month and then feeling rubbish again. You know, it was, it was all of these small little plasters that I put on this wound, but it always made me feel terrible afterwards as well. So really it's like you're exposing that wound, but at the same time, we need to try and obviously deal with that and process it. So if we have those feelings of, wow, you know, why am I crying? This isn't helping at all. Um, we need to stick at it as well. Um, ask questions is the fifth tip. So therapists should be comfortable telling you about their experience. You know, some are and some aren't, you know, but you know, if they're, I think if they're a good therapist, they should be comfortable telling you about their experience qualifications as well. If you want to find out about qualifications, they should obviously know their qualifications and be able to tell you about that. And you can do a bit of research on that as well. Um, they should also be able to tell you about different aspects of therapy, including, as we've already sort of mentioned, confidentiality, the cost, the potential length of the treatment. I think potential length of treatment is always very difficult. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you have that question around it, they should, they should be able to answer it or give you a ballpark of, you know, typically it might take, you know, 10 sessions or they should also say we, we recommend it's something that maybe you try and sort of do on, on a monthly basis as well. So I think confidentiality is key. Knowing the cost is key. Is it something that was within your budget? How many sessions are you going to have to go to and how often that you can almost budget for as well? And like we said, their experience and their qualifications as well. So like Anne, as I said, Anne doesn't have any qualifications, but really that, that wasn't a, a game changer for me. You know, I went there off a recommendation and um, was, she was the person that I managed to speak to. But equally, I think if I was, you know, advising someone who was looking for qualifications, I would say that's the question that you ask them, you know, what's your qualifications? Can I see your qualifications, et cetera? Because it's really important to have that in place as well. So definitely ask questions, find out a little bit more about them. And, and also as well, I think on that, if you're on the phone and you're asking them questions, you can almost get a feel of, is this person someone that I feel safe speaking to even over the phone? Like the way she's addressing the questions or he's addressing the questions, the, the tone of the voice, you know, the understanding, like, does this person feel like someone that I want to pursue and, and someone that I want to go and sort of see? So I think those questions when you're ringing them up and, and reaching out to them is a really key part as well. Tip number six is it's okay to feel strange about therapy. It's a big step for, for anyone. Um, don't worry about if you're anxious about starting. It might take a couple of sessions as well to get into a rhythm with your therapist. I think as, as, as Lorraine said, it's not that quick fix that you go to a therapist, you feel amazing after one session. It's like, well, I'm fixed. It is a, is a process. It's a journey. As I say, you know, I still speak to Anne and it's been what? God. Nine years now, right? Nine years since I've been, when I first went to Anne. So I don't go and see Anne on a weekly basis as I used to, but I I'd still utilize Anne as, a, as, as someone who's a, a huge part of my mental health toolbox. If I feel like I need to talk to someone about it and I feel like I need that deeper understanding of why, you know, I can pick up my phone, I can ring Anne, I can message Anne on, on Facebook, so I can um, go around and book an appointment and see her if I need to as well. So 
it's, it's a process. It's a long-term process. It's not a quick fix. So don't worry about feeling anxious. Don't worry that, you know, it might not be benefiting you after one or two sessions. It's about if you feel safe with that person, you feel comfortable, you know, just continue to see it out. And with time, you know, you might start to feel a little bit better as well. But it's completely natural to feel strange about therapy. And then the seventh one, which I think is a really key one, the last one, um, is therapy. There's no perfect time to start. Um, we're trying to move away from this reactive model that we all take when it comes to mental health and the fact that I will go and get a therapist when I need a therapist, right? And, and that's what I did. You know, I had to go and get a therapist because I was in a pretty dark place. My dad, you know, my dad's experience, my dad never went to therapy or anything like that. Um, the only time he went and seeked help was when he was at rock bottom, right? When my dad was in crisis, my dad went, booked an appointment at his doctor's because he was at a crisis point, literally like that, just in our eyes, changed behaviors very quickly and, and was in crisis. So he went and seeked, you know, help from a doctor very quickly. But at the same time, as, as, as I've shared in my story, my dad then did make an attempt on his life pretty quickly after that. And I don't, my dad never really got that help that he needed because it was very reactive. It was wait, 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 wait. Oh no, now I need to get some help because this is getting really, really unbearable. And by that time we're reacting. So I think we've still got that outlook with therapy. It's a little bit different in the States. And I think that's kind of coming over to here in the UK as well, where therapy's co like therapy's fine. Like it, it's fine to go to a therapist. It's, it doesn't mean that you're broken if you go to a therapist, right? It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you if you go to a therapist. And I think we're slowly moving towards that. But there is no perfect time to start. Like if you feel right now, but you also know that you want to improve your mental health, you want to improve your life, you want to improve the way that you feel, go to a therapist. Like it doesn't, you don't have to wait until you're broken to go to a therapist. So don't delay starting therapy. Um, of course, it could help you feel better. It could help improve your life overall and prioritize your mental health. Treat it like an investment in yourself and an investment in the future. As, as we you know, always say, self-care is a, is a priority self-care is not a luxury and a big part of my self-care is, is going to Anne and speaking to Anne and, and and going to that therapy session I always walk in even now and I'm like this I'm not up for this today like I'm, I'm good like I don't need to go and see Anne I walk in there I'll see Anne I walk out and I'm like wow well, I didn't know that was right I didn't know didn't know I needed to work on that oh that was amazing like, I'm going to do that when I get home um so it's always the way it's, it's that investment in yourself and, and remembering that there's no perfect time to start so that's for us the seven tips but um, I want to use this time, guys. You know, what's your experiences with therapy? Is there anything you want to share in the chat box that maybe is something that's valuable that might give some value to others um, within this session? What's your experiences with therapy, if you have any? I mean, if you've got any tips for them. Like, I know Lorraine shared a lot of links, which look great. Um, Pia says, I had a therapist once who made me feel extremely insecure and uncomfortable and was giving me advice that felt completely toxic. So it was a sign for me that this wasn't good. But that gave me a good understanding of what I did and need, didn't need and was then able to find a better match. I love that, Pierre. So it's not like you had this bad experience with therapy and you're like, therapy's bad. I'm never going to go to a therapist again. You were like, I've had this bad experience with a therapist. I'm going to utilize that. I'm going to learn from that. And the next experience I have with a therapist, I'm going to obviously um, use that as, as an experience I can carry through. Uh, Lorraine says, just be honest, totally honest. Yeah, I love that. I've, I've also held back so much in, in sessions with Anne, you know, three, four years after me being openly honest about her. And I thought, I don't really want to tell her about that, you know, or it might be something going on with uh, my relationship or whatever. And I'm like, I don't really want to talk about that at the moment, you know, because I just don't, because she might tell me something again that I don't really want to hear. Um, and I think that's so true, Lorraine, be honest. Like the whole idea of going to therapy is to be able to feel safe, to talk about whatever we're going through. And, and that person doesn't judge us. That person keeps it confidential. So being honest is, is hugely important. Bridget says, biggest issue I have was being honest with myself. Yeah. Caroline says, I tried it many years ago at the time. I didn't feel it helped. However, years later, revisited therapy and it was the best thing I ever did. I found CBT extremely helpful and also acupuncture. Nice. Man, it's a CBT when in the middle of grief didn't help, felt judged. Yeah. Uh, Caroline says, Mandy, I think I had to sit with my grief for a lot of years before I could open up. Grief's one of those where I always say time plays a massive part with grief, right? You know, I think everyone says time's a healer. You know, I don't know whether time's a healer, but I think the process of grief and the way we manage it is, is very much down to time. 
equally at the same time, I don't like when people say, oh, you know, it's been 11 years, you should have got over it by now. Um, you know, you never get over grief. But at the same time, I think, as Caroline says, we almost have to manage grief in our own way and in our own time as well. Uh, Mandy, if, if you've, um, if that didn't work, again, maybe sort of looking at what um, Pia said and, and kind of thinking, okay, CBT didn't help me for that. Maybe I can look at a different sort of, you know, therapist that might be able to help with that too as well. Cool. I really like this session, guys. Like, I think that there was a lot of value from 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 your perspective, which I really appreciate as well. Um, and we are going to create some content around this. I'm going to use some of those links, Lorraine, and we're going to add it into the app. We might do a couple of content for social media as well. I think that, I think it's I think it's a really key topic. Polly says I had two different experiences in therapy. Initially, I was referred after a serious suicide attempt in my late teens. I saw a psychologist training in CBT therapy it works well at the time in my life as i've matured the type of therapy i've accessed has changed i've also added aspects of neuroscience to my development as understanding of what is going on physiologically in my brain helps me a great deal i really like that polly and again that's your own journey and, and I, I like the fact that you've almost figured out and you've researched and found out you know what's beneficial to you um I always say the best thing that helped me was becoming a scientist, right? Where you experiment with a lot, you, you look into different things, you try different, you know, things that maybe you've read about or you've researched and, and you say to yourself, has that helped me personally? And the ones that do, you bank them in your toolbox and you're like, I'm going to use them again. The ones that don't, you kind of just dismiss. Um, so yeah, I'm always looking into more poly. And there's a guy called Daniel Amen, I think his name is. Daniel Amen. he's got a really good TED Talk poly about the link between the brain and mental health in general. So you might want to check that out. Other people might want to check that out. I might have got his name wrong, Dan, Daniel Amen, I think it is. And he talks about how mental illness, mental health, when it comes to the practice or psychology, when it comes to the practice, it's the only practice that we don't look at the organ that we're treating, right? We don't look at the brain. So you wouldn't go to someone with back problems and they say, hey, we think you've done this, but we're not going to look at your spine. We're not going to look at your back. With, with mental health and psychology, it's very much that we just cluster, or psychiatry, he was talking about, we cluster symptoms and we then give you a diagnosis. And I think it's really, you know, it, it's something again to look into. I also think, you know, trauma is a big part of therapy. There's a lot of people that specialize in trauma and I believe that trauma is a big, you know, catalyst behind a lot of what we, you know, are experiencing and going through as well. Um, Mandy says, art therapy, a true therapy better for me at that time. Yeah, our therapy is cool. George says, as a sociologist, visit us after my father's passing, but she seemed bored and distant and didn't help us much about grief. Yeah, like it, there's so much about the personality of the person, right? Like, you know, if we don't, if we don't have that rapport straight away, even the way they're acting, their tone of voice, their body language and the environment, it, it's very difficult. People always ask me, do you think having group therapy of your family would have helped you straight after dad? And I'm not sure because... I don't know whether I would have opened up as much. I don't think my mum would have opened up. You know, my mum definitely probably wouldn't have opened up because, you know, we're her sons. You know, she probably wouldn't tell us and the therapist how she was really feeling because she'd feel like she was burdening us with that. So I think a lot of it is is time and finding what works for you as well. Uh, da, 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 da. Polly says, best tip I was ever given was be curious. I'll definitely check that TED Talk out. Thank you. She says, I'm a trauma specialist. So glad you mentioned that. Yeah, like I believe trauma is... Is a big reason behind a lot of a lot of you know mental health challenges a lot of the times as well and different traumas on different levels that's just my own personal experience as well guys um richard said listen to fern cotton's happy place and she talked about counseling directory and happy for going to check it out yeah happy for i believe have just launched an app that connects you to a lot of therapists um th there's obviously a big intake or a big uptake in online therapy as well now especially with covid situ the situation pushing it where people were going face to face and they were like, Hey, during this time we can still do therapy, but we'll have to do it via Skype or via FaceTime or Zoom or whatever. And people were very skeptical at first, but I believe now people are actually saying, actually, this, this still is effective. So I think there's going to be a real shift into online therapy, which will dramatically then drop the prices, I believe as well, not dramatically, but a little bit in terms of dropping the prices. Um, but I would also just be cautious, you know, you've got better help. 
BetterHelp have reached out to me personally to do some promos for them and, and, you know, make an affiliate commission if I get people to sign up to it. And it's never really sat well with me. I necessarily don't know much about the platform, so I'm, I'm, I'm not one to obviously share it. But at the same time, I'm not one to bash it because it could be good. But, you know, that's really kind of like signing up on a monthly subscription and you get access to therapists. But, you know, I don't want to be a headline reader, but there's been a little bit of sort of, you know, making sure the therapists have the right credentials and the right people. Um, on the platform itself but yeah counseling directory is one you know my mum was a counselor my mum trained to be a counselor you know a couple of years after my dad and she went on the counseling directory and they're very thorough with their checks as far as I was aware um Lorraine says I presented at a mental health unit at a hospital voluntary after my dad died as I was consumed by grief I spoke to a psychiatrist he took me in sat me down made me a tea and listen he gave me some sleeping tablets and said you need to sleep and to talk regularly so look for a counselor I just assumed I was seriously, seriously mentally ill. Him listening helped. Yeah. And a good friend of mine, Johnny Benjamin, um, spoke about when he was in a mental health unit and how the person who helped him did one small thing, right? And I don't know if you guys can still see me on webcam. But imagine this is a clipboard. He said every psychiatrist, every person that was dealing with him in a mental health ward, you know, every therapy session who did dealt with him like this. So the clipboard's here and they're here. And it was very much like, Johnny, you know, tell me about yourself. Johnny, you know, in the last two weeks, have you ever felt this way? And you can imagine, like, the clipboard is here. And, and he was just like, that whole clinical kind of approach of like this, da, 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 just, just didn't make him feel safe. It made him feel judged. It made him feel like he'd been, you know, everything that he'd been watching in the Hollywood movies of like, now he's living this life. And he said the best thing that ever happened to him was someone who he saw, they walked in, they had the clipboard and Johnny was like, oh, here we go again. And that person put the clipboard down and then just sat there. It's like, you know, Johnny, how have you been? And Johnny was like, you know, he speaks about it in, in the video that he did for us. And it was like, that hit me hard because I was like, no matter your qualifications, no matter your credentials, the compassion element, like the human element of it is something that you can never ever replace. And, and I love that whole story of like, just putting the clipboard down and like just being human with Johnny. And Johnny was like, and then I felt safe. I felt safe to start talking. I felt safe to speak to that person as well. And he still sees that same person today. Um, trauma can physically change the way our brain processes things. And in early childhood can actually change the brain structures. Yeah. I've done a lot of research into it as well, Polly. And it's good to hear that you're saying on that same path. Uh, Richard says, issue I have online is that I don't have a safe space at home where I can open up. Yeah, that is so true, Richard. Um, and that's a difficulty as well. Caroline says, have you heard of Shout text line? If you need a moment, you can help in text. If been speaking in a safe space is an issue. Yeah, Shout is, I should know this off by heart. Um, Shout is a good service. We recommend them. I've done some, some work with them as well. And it's 85258, 85258. And just like a text message to them is, is, is confidential. Um, and it's there too, but I, I completely get that, Richard. If you don't feel safe within your own environment, then like online counseling might not work. Online therapy might not work. Polly says compassion, empathy, empowerment, collaboration, and trustworthiness. Key elements of the trauma-informed approach. Love it. And Caroline's a crisis volunteer for them. Amazing, Caroline. I never knew that. Good stuff. Um, guys, completely appreciate all of your honesty. Um, if you do have any questions, I'm just cautious of time. You know, feel free to to email me. So I'm going to put my email in here. I'm sure most of you have got it. That is always everyone at work.com. Um, and we will be putting some content out around this as well. Probably not on the COVID-19 page. If you go over to everyone at work.com forward slash blog um, over the next couple of weeks, we're probably going to put this into a, a long article about, you know, finding the right therapist, the importance of therapy, you know, kind of more of an extent of, of what we've gone in today. And we want to kind of make it a big resource. And I'm going to use some of those links that you've shared Lorraine as well. So feel free to email me at any time um, about that. And we are also, if you've got access to the app, if your business has got access to the app, we're going to be adding some content in to the app as well that's very specific to that as well. Um, and guys, if you do want any more information about the app, I know some of you are on it, but if your business is looking for a solution in terms of you know mental health support, um, you know we only launched the, the app probably, what, three, four months ago now. And, and in, during that time, we've partnered with, we're approaching sort of 75 businesses now that have access to the platform and their employees are using the platform. And for me, it's about getting personal experience out there, giving people the tools that they need to sort of manage their own mental health at the same time, recommending them to other support. We're trying to build in, um, you know, this isn't going to be anytime soon, 
a directory of, of therapists that we recommend that they can obviously utilize as well. Um, so guys, if you want a little bit more information on that as well, again, feel free to, to reach out to me, paulevermindatwork.com. And if it's something that your business or something that you can recommend to your HR team or your your um, CEO, whoever it is, you know, I'd really kind of appreciate that. We're offering it free for six months as well with no obligation. So it's something that we're trying to sort of give back during this time. Hopefully you've seen from my personal story that it's really a sort of passion of mine, even though it's a business too. Um, so yeah, kind of let me know if you want any more information on that. Just drop me an email at paul at everymindatwork.com. It'd be great to support your business or a friend of yours businesses or whoever. You know, we're trying to provide the accessible, affordable support to companies during this difficult time. So guys, really, really appreciate your time. Um, as always, if you do want to reach out, reach out, but I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week. Um, if you have any ideas for topics, do send them over. We're creating a bit of a sort of calendar at the moment. We're going to have a couple of guests on. So really kind of looking forward to the next couple of weeks as well. Enjoy the rest of your day guys. Um, and thank you so much for, for sharing as well. All right guys, speak soon.